Okay, thank you for joining us today for uh, staying connected. I'd like to welcome uh, David Heyman. Uh, he's a professor of epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He serves as a special advisor to the, to the World Health Organization, and for 22 years, he was based at the WHO in Geneva on the Common for the Centers of uh, uh, Disease Control and Prevention, this commonly known as the CDC. Now, if you've been following the news of the virus, there's no doubt you've heard this guy's name. He's been interviewed by so many news outlets, including the BBC, the CBS, The Guardian, uh, The Times. He is a world-leading outbreaks expert. He led the global effort that effectively stamped out the SARS virus. Uh, one of his colleagues described him as a globe-trotting detective for identifying infectious diseases and combating outbreaks. It's safe to say that no one knows more about the emergence and containment of the coronavirus. And joining us live from France, it's a pleasure to see you and welcome you to the Maddox Fat Gallery community, Professor. Well, thanks very much, and thanks for the kind invitation. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank uh, almost a thousand people who have joined us from around uh, the world, not just the UK, uh, to hear your comments and hopefully get answers to the questions that have been submitted. And people have submitted questions. Uh, over 300 questions were submitted, and while we won't have time to answer all of them. Uh, many people ask similar questions. Some of them are unique. Uh, to start us off, the first question comes from Claire Hall. Claire's asked a very simple question. Does immunity exist? And that's a very good question. And nobody really can answer that question yet, unfortunately. What we do know is that other coronaviruses that cause the common cold in humans do not develop a solid immunity so that people can be reinfected. One year they can have a cold caused by this coronavirus, the next year again by the same coronavirus. We also know that there are some studies going on in Korea right now, which are looking to see if people who have become positive on their diagnostic test three weeks after having been recovered and been negative, are really um, reinfected, or if it's just a recrudescence of the current infection. So the short answer is we don't know exactly if there is immunity, how long that immunity will last, and how long it will protect against the infection. Okay. I mean, Carol Oliver wrote to us and asked, uh, which sort of follows on from the immunity question, if, if I get this, um, can I get it again? If I catch it once, will I, do you think I'm going to catch it again? And that's the question that everybody has and nobody can answer, unfortunately. It will take time and it will take studies like the one going on in South Korea, where I believe there are about 50 people who seem to have been either reinfected or had a recrudescence of their existing infection, which disappeared somewhere in the body and then came back and showed up in the diagnostic tests. Those studies are underway. What they will do is compare the virus that's occurring, that's causing the infection now with the virus that caused the previous infection and see if they're identical or if they're different. If they're different, then they will assume it's been a reinfection. And do you think if the virus um, mutates, does that make it more, if a virus mutated, and this is a question from Melody Nichols, is it easy to recatch it again? Um, is, it, is, it, is it easy to get infected again from it because it's a kind of a new strain? Yeah, I think the answer to that lies in the future. But I can say that for influenza, this influenza, there are three human influenza viruses, and they constantly mutate a small amount called drift. And by drifting, they actually require each year a new vaccine. There's no indication that the coronavirus will do that, but that's what happens if there is drift. Sometimes it escapes the immunity that's there, and you have to provide new immunity with, in the case of influenza, a new component in the vaccine. Okay. Now, Carl Woodward's asked a question, and I got to tell you, this question, so many people asked a variant of this question, and it's really, really simple. How effective, in your opinion, are the standard face masks? And I'm going to make it a two parter because Karen King also says, what kind of material and fit does a face mask have to be to best help? Okay, well, face masks are very controversial right now because everybody is worried about whether they should be wearing them or not. I think WHO has provided the best guidance on that, and it's as follows. Masks, and medical masks, and especially those with N95 filters, are very important and vital for healthcare workers, but they must also wear other 
protective equipment, such as a visor, to protect the eyes, because the infection can also enter through the eyes. So for health workers, masks are a necessity to prevent them from getting infected, along with other things, including covering the eyes. Masks are used to protect others if someone is sick. And in Asia, people have the custom of wearing a mask when they're coughing or sneezing to prevent themselves infecting others. And that's a very important use of a mask. And that can be a cotton mask or it can be a medical mask. So people who are coughing or sneezing and who are unable to social or physically distance, for example, a carer of someone who is elderly who can't socially or physically distance from that person should be wearing a mask to prevent that person from becoming infected. Masks do not protect people from infection. And one of the reasons, of course, is that the eyes are also an entry point for infection. So masks do not prevent infection in the general population if they're used only as a mask. But there is some evidence coming from Singapore that people who are infected, not yet showing symptoms, but a day or so before symptoms, could possibly be transmitting infection to others. And so that's why countries like the US have suggested that people when they go out wear some kind of face cover, even pull their scarf over their nose and mouth, because they feel that that would prevent those people who are infected from infecting others. But masks have no place in trying to protect oneself. To protect oneself, it's physical distancing, social distancing, stay away from crowds of people, and at the same time, hand washing and making sure that you use the proper cough etiquette and wash surfaces and keep surfaces clean where droplets may be from infected persons. So really the, the biggest takeaway I got from that, which is incredibly informative, is unless you yourself are ill, or perhaps uh, in, in a vicinity of someone that you're acting as a carer, using a mask on the street in day-to-day -day life really serves no immediate function. That's absolutely right, yes. It's curious to me, uh, I'm jumping in a little bit here, you, you've mentioned about the eyes, and I suppose that speaks to why there's been so much education about try not to touch your face as much as you can. And I think I heard somewhere that the average person uh, on average, a person touches their face two to 3,000 times a day or without even realizing it. And now we're all much more self-conscious of that, every little nudge and wink. Um, so it's interesting to hear that you, you, an, uh, the eyes are quite a vulnerable spot for ourselves and the frontline uh, medical workers. That's right. Any mucous membrane of the body is a potential source of entry of a droplet that's infected with the virus. Now, this kind of leads in a little bit to what you were saying before. Um, Alex Nightingale has asked this question. Um, can you catch the coronavirus from breathing in air on the street or just walking or running uh, a couple of meters away from someone? So if I was walking two meters behind someone and they're breathing out, there's a potential like rain off a dashboard of a car. It's going to hit me. Two meters is what generally countries are recommending. And we know that droplets don't go much further than that when someone is breathing or speaking or um, and possibly even coughing lightly. But it's still wise to maintain as much of a distance as you can. And walking behind would be not as advisable, certainly, as walking beside uh, someone at a two meter interval. So just using common sense and staying away. You know, if you watch people who smoke electronic uh, devices, for example, mm -hmm. you can see clearly how long that smoke stays in the air and where it stays in the air. And so that's a good indication of how you might gauge your own distance. But two meters is a minimum. You know, that's actually, I don't think I've heard that before. That's a fantastic analogy comparison. The idea that when you're smoking, um, I don't smoke, uh, but if you're smoking or vaping, when that smoke gets in the air and it lingers, is uh, somewhat equitable to the virus lingering in the air as well. It's a bit lighter, but it shows the, the ways that it does spread within the air. Smoke is a bit lighter and vaping vapor. Now, Anna Toka is one of our clients and she wrote to us and she asked a great question, but I'm, I'm smiling at it because my wife had the immediate reaction when we did a food shop recently. And she saw uh, someone saying this on the BBC. Uh, the question is, 
do we need to clean wipe with sanitizing tissue dead all whatever um, every package that we get delivered or anything we buy from the supermarket bring it home have a station in, in our in our house in the kitchen where you wipe down everything before you stock it away well another good question and certainly food that's delivered by the the grocers is food that has been handled in the right way because they know how to handle it they come they leave it in front of the door they walk away they're wearing gloves so that is probably fairly safe um, i can't answer your question about foods from the grocery that you would bring into the house but i think they're fairly safe most uh, supermarkets are being careful in letting people not letting people in who are coughing widely or doing things like that there are there are some checks that are going on at some supermarkets but there's always that risk and it depends on how risk averse you really are but i think the risk is very small but at the surface of a table where someone who's sick and is talking over that table could very well be infected okay um now paul elkington wrote a, a, a question but a lot of people had this question and i guess we're wanting to be optimistic especially as we head into easter and everyone is thinking of the families that they're living with driving them insane and the families that they miss because they can't see do you think social distancing in the uk is having any effect on the spread of the disease and and do you when do you think if you can say well do you expect the curve to go down well you know the outbreak control is in the hands of the people really if people understand how to protect themselves and how to protect others they can do a lot towards decreasing transmission of the virus what the uk and other countries in europe are undergoing now is forced physical distancing it's forcing that physical distancing that all people should be doing to an extreme but when people finally do start to go out again or when they go out for their daily exercise, they must remember that the power to prevent this pandemic from continuing to spread is in their hands. It's in all of our hands. Asians have understood that since the very beginning. And Asians have managed by making sure that their populations understand what's going on, by stopping some of the outbreaks that have occurred, and by making sure that they, they facilitate the um, understanding of their populations. They've been able to keep the reproductive number, which is the number of people infected by every infected person to less than one. So they've actually controlled transmission in communities just by personal behaviors. And recently they've begun to lock down some sectors, but they didn't lock those down at the start and they've still maintained a low level. But the people are, are there's a solidarity among the people to do what they need to do to stop the outbreak. Uh, that's an interesting question because Daniel wrote in and asked us the question, uh, this question, which is interesting, especially in context to your last answer, which you're talking about outbreak control really is in the hands of the people right now and that we're going through a forced distancing. Um, the, the, the question is, he's, he's actually written, I'm going to read it word for word. Why did all the governments in the world choose to do a total close down for this disease now the answer is probably a little bit more obvious to some people because they're really interested in this topic but i guess if i can paraphrase for daniel who's written this question is is this the best response i mean you've dealt with some atrocious diseases in your career do you think this is absolutely the right way to be handling this a complete shutdown well it's very interesting china is the one that began the the, the lockdown and by doing so, they stopped travel out of China when they realized that it was spreading internationally, or maybe after that. But they did lock down travel and they locked down people in the outbreak site. As a result, uh, they gave other countries the possibility to prepare and to get ready. And countries in Asia did a much better job than countries in Europe and North America. In fact, countries in Asia had been through the SARS outbreak previously they were ready and they knew what they needed to do. And they jumped on those cases as soon as they came into the country mm -hmm. and did standard outbreak containment activities, identifying people who were sick, diagnosing them, isolating them, 
and then examining their contacts, and if their contacts were or became infected, they were isolated. That's the standard way of stopping an outbreak, and they began that from the very beginning. Some European countries, such as Germany, also began that, and the UK began that as well. Um, when cases came in early on, they jumped on them and stopped them from, from continuing to spread. But then there was an explosive event that occurred in, in Europe, in Italy, um, where there was transmission that somehow um, occurred very easily among a whole group of people and people who were visiting Italy. And then when they returned home, they took the infection with them and started many different outbreaks in Europe. And that in many ways overwhelmed the outbreak containment possibilities of countries. And they gave up on it and they went more towards identifying patients, isolating patients and managing them. Interestingly, Sky News has just um, reported uh, breaking news that the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, um, has said the UK must keep going uh, with the coronavirus lockdown measures. Uh, he told Britons uh, literally in the last couple of minutes, we're not done yet. So, uh, and the UK government isn't going to speak further about when lockdown, lockdown measures might end until the end of next week. So it looks like for, at least for another week, we're going to be in lockdown. Um, Anna James asks, uh, will COVID-19 completely disappear from the UK? And I guess this is a future question. You know, is this going to eventually dissipate or will there, will there always be a strain of this around, but immunity or vaccines will help mm -hmm. combat it? Well, I think it's a, it's a very good question. And you know, um, when an infection crosses the species barrier between an animal and a human, the problem is we don't know what its destiny really is. We don't know the possibility of it becoming what we call endemic, a disease that remains among human populations. Influenza viruses all come or have come mm -hmm. from wild waterfowl, ducks, wild geese, and they come into human populations. There are about 18 of these different viruses in waterfowl. They come into human populations and some of them become what we call endemic and cause seasonal influenza. There are three of those viruses right now in human populations. Others come into human populations, cause an epidemic or a pandemic, and then they disappear. So some viruses can cross the border and become endemic. HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, crossed the disease barrier in the late 19th or early 20th century. And it continued to transmit in populations in Africa for many, many years until its transmission became amplified when it got to capital cities. And then it jumped on an airplane, sped around the world, and it's now endemic. With SARS coronavirus, it did not become endemic. It was stopped because of a rapid reaction of many different countries. This virus hasn't been stopped rapidly. And it, we'll see now what the destiny really is. No one can predict. The other thing that people often ask about is, will this decrease in the summer months? And again, nobody can really predict what will happen. Other respiratory infections, the common cold, influenza, they do decrease in summer months when people begin to get outdoors, out of confined spaces. But the jury is still out on this virus. We just don't know how it will behave. Claudia has asked us, um, I mean, you've answered so many questions there. It's fantastic. I'm, I'm trying to move down my, my list of hundreds to, to a question that you haven't come across yet. Uh, someone's asked a, a, a fairly basic question. Would you suggest when possible you, you don't leave the house at all, not even for uh, the daily exercise that's being encouraged sometimes by some authorities or walk with the family? And that's from Claudia who's asked that. Um, do you think it's best just to lock ourselves in or if we can leave, we should do that safely. Just make sure you're maintaining the, uh, the distancing that's required. Well, I think this depends on a person's tolerance of what they perceive as risk. Certainly, it's very important to have daily exercise. We know that, and it's important not to stop it. Some people prefer to do that exercise indoors. Some people prefer to do it outdoors, respecting physical distancing. And I think either one is fine. You know, whatever people feel most comfortable with, but exercise should not be stopped, clearly. Well, here's an interesting one because a lot of people, yeah. and it was quite amazing, so many people asked us a question about their personal health and shared something quite personal. Um, and Lindsay Barry is one of those people. She says, uh, as someone with a rare blood and bone cancer, and she refers to it as multiple myeloma, 
Yes. How mm -hmm. long do you think I'm going to be at home for in that situation? And well, people with a, a disease such as that who have an immunosuppression as a result of infection, as cancers or other diseases, must be very careful. And they must stay at home until it's clear that they can leave. And that's the unfortunate part. The elderly over 80 are very susceptible, over 70 are susceptible, over 80 very, very susceptible to serious disease and at the same time um, to, to death. So it's very important that people with immunosuppression or comorbidities such as hypertension, such as cardiac disease or lung disease, should be very, very careful and stay at home as long as they're told to by the government. And there is hope because the government in UK and in most countries, just governments are now doing what are called zero surveys to determine the level of people in communities who have had infection in the past. And that will help to better understand what the risks are in the community, whether or not this virus is spreading very, very easily or not so easily. And, and that's been the whole Achilles heel of understanding this infection is we don't yet understand its true transmissibility. And so the modelers have wide ranges of estimates. They say, oh, the majority of the population will be um, infected within a very short period of time. Others say very few. Um, and nobody really can estimate clearly until we get some of that information from communities, which will tell us how easily it's transmitted. So people who have comorbidities or who are worried about an infection because they have an immunosuppression, unfortunately have to continue isolating. Okay. Um, hopefully these questions now are, 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 are going to be a little bit more interesting because I've never heard anyone answer these questions before. Um, uh, Luke asks, at what infection rate um, does herd immunity work? Like the idea, we've heard it at first, we were going to go this herd immunity solution in the UK, and then suddenly they changed their mind and went for a lockdown. Give us the, the short answer. What essentially is herd immunity and why, why aren't we doing it in this occasion? Herd immunity is when there's enough of the population infected that the virus can no longer transmit from people who have it. It's like a wall around the virus. And herd immunity for a disease such as measles, which has a much higher transmissibility, is about 99%. For polio, it's about 90%. So herd immunity needs to be very high in order to stop transmission. But as I said earlier, we don't even understand if these antibodies can protect against reinfection. So people who talk about herd immunity are talking way ahead of any evidence. We don't know how many people are being infected in communities yet. We don't know whether or not this antibody protects. And so when people make this, it's mainly the modelers who are making an estimate based on assumptions. And those assumptions are that this antibody works like other antibody and will protect against future infection. And that its transmissibility is very high in the communities and therefore has left a lot of people with antibody and they're immune. But these are only guesses by the modelers based on knowledge or information that they have at present. Now, Three weeks, it'll be much we more accurate. About. We were talking about this before the um, before the call. You and I we chatted for about half an hour. Um, I, I didn't even think of this as a question, and it's amazing that so many people asked it. Um, uh, Sigil Suntung asks, "Can cats get the coronavirus? Could an infected pet infect a human?" And a lot of people asked about their pets and the, about the ability to catch this virus um, from them. Is is that a realistic concern? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a concern that the, the, the animals are infected and transmitting to others. But certainly if an animal is in the household of a person who's infected and that person is coughing in the region of the cat or dog and the fur becomes contaminated with droplets and another family member pets that animal, doesn't wash hands and touches the face, they could become infected. So they could be wow, just okay. like a tabletop or anything else, a surface, where the virus could be taken if you touch it. Wow, okay, that's really interesting. So if you do take your pets out for a walk, don't let a stranger pet them is probably the biggest takeaway from that. Good advice, thank you. <laughs> uh, now, Kate Heels asked a question and it was a, it was a unique question that Kate asked. Um, it's very simple. Did you 
see this coming? Did you predict or forecast that a virus like this would eventually cause such a global disruption? Well, we saw a virus cause global dis disruption in 1917 and 18 with the influenza. And we saw that other influenza viruses were quite virulent. The avian influenza, the bird flu, if you remember, was quite, or still is, quite vicious in human populations. And the concern was that that virus might cause a pandemic. So I think everybody was anticipating a pandemic, but very few were really prepared for one. And most governments were not prepared, even though they felt they might be, and they had been doing exercises to see what would happen should such an outbreak occur. But this is a very different virus from an influenza virus. And again, we don't clearly understand yet its full potential. So was I anticipating it? I wasn't anticipating this outbreak, but I anticipated that sometime there could be an outbreak that there were many in the past, and why couldn't it occur again? And in fact, the World Health Organization always has had on their disease list of diseases that might cause an epidemic or a pandemic, a disease called disease X. And now we're living that disease X. Okay. Um, I'm gonna actually, the, the chat that we've got on the side of our screens here is going nuts. People are asking questions. I'm gonna borrow from one of those for a second. Yvonne's just asked uh, or made the comment, death rates seem very high. So are the reported rates valid? Do we really know the mortality rate when the denominator is unknown? What are your thoughts on that? We don't know the mortality rate when the denominator is under known, what, unknown. What we're seeing now is mortality rates of people who are sick and admitted to a hospital and diagnosed as COVID uh, positive. When they're positive, they're there considered as a case and the mortality is balanced on those cases. That takes away all the less severe cases and the people who are asymptomatic from the denominator. And of course, the mortality ratio will be very high. What most people think is that the ratio might be around 1%. But again, this is an unknown and there has to be a lot more observation. And um, some information is coming out from China now that may help with that understanding. Catherine Rich has asked, uh, at what temperatures does the a virus, does this virus or virus like it die or become inactive? Um, and if the latter, at what temperature can it possibly revive? Uh, it's a unique yeah. question and, and that's uh, and possibly a good one. It's a good question. Yeah, this virus cannot survive an autoclave. So if it goes into an autoclave with high temperatures under pressure, it will not survive. That's why sterilization is important in certain implements. Understanding um, how long it survives at room temperature is just beginning to be studied. And there are some studies that suggest, as most people know, that this virus could last possibly up to 72 hours if the droplet in which it's contained remains moist on a plastic surface. On other surfaces where it dries up, where the virus dries up within the, moist, the droplet, it has a much lower um, lifespan. So it's not really understood. But the maximum that people have seen is in laboratories is 72 hours on a plastic surface where the droplets have remained intact and have not dried up. Right, okay. Good to know. Um, well, following on that, Mark Parker had a good question. Do saunas and high temperature rooms, do they have any destructive effect on a virus? I can't answer that question, but I, you know, it would depend on the individual virus. Sure. Most viruses, especially those for the common cold, would not be affected by a sauna. Okay. Now, Amanda Cecil asked, are there different types of COVID-19? Because so many people are having different reactions, or is that based on the individual person just simply having a different reaction to the same virus? There's only one virus, one SARS coronavirus 2 virus, but there are variations of that because it mutates periodically. There's a global database called GISAID, G -I -S -A -I -D, where genetic sequences are provided, and it's shown that the virus does mutate or drift a little bit. But drifting has never been shown to correlate with severity of infection or transmissibility. So it's not changing in any way in transmissibility. Now, repeat the question again. Uh, Are there different types of COVID-19? 
Is yeah, that why no people different having types. different reactions? Yeah, no different types. The reaction is due to the human who is infected. And that depends on whether they have comorbidities, their age, their immune status, and a whole series of other, other issues that we don't really understand. But it's thought that over 80% of cases are mild and that there's a certain percentage of infections which are asymptomatic. Okay. Georgine has asked, um, and I don't think she understands what, why ventilators are helping, because she's asked how effective are ventilators at treating the virus? Now, obviously, it's not treating the virus, is it? It's more about assisting when the virus really is attacking the body. That's right. This virus in some people causes acute respiratory distress syndrome, which decreases the oxygen level in the blood. And therefore, when that decreases, people need oxygen. They either need a face mask with oxygen or a nasal cannula. And if they can't get the blood oxygen levels up with those procedures, then many times they're put to sleep and intubated and, be, and they're breathed on a ventilator. And they're breathed until their oxygen level is sustained at a high level. And then again, they may be taken off the ventilator and they will again um, be breathing normal air. So a ventilator breathes for someone else, and that occurs when a person can no longer saturate their blood with the oxygen they need by breathing oxygen passively. Okay. Um, pandemics are, it's kind of a new word that's taken over the world for obvious reasons. Uh, Emmanuel asks, how does a pandemic eventually subside? minus a cure. Without a cure, what, what traditionally would happen? What do, you, what, what do you estimate would happen? Well, if the pandemic continues and there's no cure and there's no vaccine, it would likely become endemic in human populations. But that depends on a lot of different things. It depends on how virulent it is and how well it can sustain its transmission because of its virulence. If you look at HIV, it was really a perfect organism to become endemic because it had a very, has a very long period when it's asymptomatic, yet it can still spread at periods of time during that time. And so it was able to spread silently in many places before it was even recognized that it was present. But if you look at the Ebola virus, it's very virulent. That virus could likely never become endemic because it's too virulent and kills people who it infects and there's not a possibility for it to be transmitted to others. This virus is much, much less virulent than Ebola and, and, and it's closer to the virulence of influenza, but it's still much more virulent, we believe, than influenza, especially for the elderly. And so the question is not answerable at present, whether or not it will become endemic, but pandemics, if they linger for a long period of time, generally do become pandemic, uh, endemic rather. So that could be the destiny of this virus, but it's sure. not clear yet. Thank you very much. I think I, I want to get to you and I joked about this before the call, a couple of conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. um, and a okay. lot of people asked about this. The first one, um, and I won't name the individual, but someone's basically asked, uh, can actually be proven this was the case with this virus that it switched from an animal to a human host? Um, because there's a lot of uh, theories on the internet that it, came from uh, a, an animal and it switched. And, and, and even I don't know what the truth is there. So your, your best place to, to clarify how something like this sort of evolves into COVID-19 that we're seeing experience today. Okay, well, let, let me start by saying there's a, a, an animal, a mammal in nature that is able to carry many, many different viruses, the Ebola virus, virulent coronaviruses, many different viruses and their immune system tolerates those viruses and they don't get sick. And that animal, that mammal is the bat. A bat can carry all of these viruses. Now the coronavirus that's present today in humans is, um, was when it first was identified over 99% um, in correspondence with a similar virus in bats. So the theory is that the virus has come from bats either directly to humans or indirectly through an animal or a market that was infected by the bat or the bat's excretions and then infected humans. So our understanding is that this bat, because of its close relationship to the um, uh, bat viruses, is 
a virus that came from nature. Okay. Um, now, someone's actually asked about the technology 5G. Now, uh, for those of you who might not be aware of it, because I know, David, you weren't aware when we were talking about it a few minutes ago, there is a theory going around that 5G technology, which is a, the, the next evolution in cell phone um, carrier signals, is the cause of this. Um, and it's been debunked pretty aggressively, yet the question still comes up. And unfortunately, we've seen a ridiculous reaction from some members of the public actually going out of their way to damage some of these towers um, and set them on fire, which is actually completely contrary to what we need right now, is for us all to stay connected and more importantly for our health services to stay connected. But right now, can you clarify once and for all, so to speak, that there is really no foundation whatsoever that something like a wireless technology would be contributing to the existence or the exacerbation of this virus spreading? Well, no other viruses that appear to be spread in this manner. Um, we've had epidemics and pandemics in the past years, and they haven't been spread by 4G, and I expect now they're not being spread by 5G. And I would think it's just a theory, um, which is, again, uh, difficult for the Chinese and for Chinese people living of, of Chinese origin living in countries outside of China, that there's discrimination against China because of this outbreak. And I think that's just a manifestation of concern by some people about China and about the fact that um, Chinese are producing most things that we buy today, unfortunately, because that's the way we've allowed the economy to work. Not unfortunately, it's just a fact that that's what's happening. Countries have given up their manufacturing and China has filled the gap and is providing those things. So I think it's a theory. Um, it's a theory which to me is, has no grounds whatsoever and I think it's a shame that there would be any concern about something produced in China, uh, such as 5G, when we're wearing clothing and many other things that come from China and using those things every day. Andre's asked a good question. Is it possible for an asymptomatic carrier uh, not to manifest the full symptoms of the virus? Yes, we believe that there are people who are infected who never show any signs or symptoms. And we believe there are a great majority of people who show minor signs and symptoms and occasionally um, symptoms of a common cold. Once they get those symptoms of a common cold, which is coughing and sneezing and a fever, then if they are infected with the coronavirus, they're very dangerous to the rest of the population because they can transmit. And those are the people who um, usually are told to self-isolate. Everybody who has signs and symptoms of a cold is told to self-isolate. And if they get seriously ill, they're to get to their GP, to call Martin, to their GP. Thank you. Martin Reeves asked, how long until the majority of us get this? Uh, and what do you think is the most promising research right now or things being done to find a cure vaccine? Well, the most, the, 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 the answer I can give about um, uh, the, the first, first question was what again? Basically, how, how long do you think before everyone gets this? Is it inevitable yeah. that the majority of the public yeah. are going to get this? Nobody can answer that. But, you know, within two or three weeks, there will be the results of surveys that have been done in the UK to see how many people might have been inf infected since this virus was first, first entered the UK. And that information will be available very soon. And then the government will make some decisions with its expert advisors about what to recommend to the population at that point in time. So I can't answer that question at present, but the data is coming. Um, so the other question got, was so the, uh, what, vaccines the and drugs. Promising research before to finding yeah. a cure or a vaccine. Well, there's a lot of vaccine research going on right now. There are over 35 uh, different groups, mainly biotech companies, trying to develop a prototype vaccine. And then that vaccine will be studied likely first in macaque monkeys, which can be infected by this virus and in other animal models. Although some of the vaccines, which are a new technology for development, might go directly into human safety studies without going through animal models, depending on how they're deemed, um, as whether they're deemed to be safe for human use. This is something which the regulatory agencies are working with. As you know, there is one vaccine already in human study looking at its safety and ability to provide um, immunity. And there will be more coming through, but no one believes 
that there will be a licensed vaccine, if there is ever one, before um, the beginning or early 2021. For as far as drugs go, there's a lot of research going on. And two drugs that are being studied right now intensively are remdesivir, which is a drug used um, against other viruses. This is being studied in clinical trials where they're comparing people who get this drug to people who don't get it. And there's also a study with hydroxychloroquine, which is a drug used to treat malaria, which is thought by some to have an effect. So those studies are going on in the UK and in other countries, comparing people who get the drug to people who don't. There's also work being done on antibodies in the hopes that antibodies are effective and could possibly modify an infection if they're given early, preventing people from getting serious illness. And there are finally companies that are developing monoclonal antibodies, which are certain parts of the antibody complex that might be even more potent and when they're used to treat patients. So all this research is going on, but the bottom line is we don't understand immunity and we don't know yet which drugs might work. But if drugs do are effective, um, they, we should soon know that. With vaccines, it'll be a longer term. It's the first time the world's going through anything like this. Do you think it's going to be something that's going to happen a little bit more regularly now, or is this kind of a semi-worst case scenario? What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's not the first time the world's gone through this, but it's the first time the world's gone through this on fast forward. In the past, it's been very slow on ships that brought the plague in or cholera in. And then in the 20th century, we began to understand that some infections could spread internationally and that borders couldn't stop infections. But now we're seeing that the transmission is really ramped up because it spreads around the world very rapidly. So we're a globalized community, whether we like it or not, and we just have to adapt to that. And there will be more. There will be more emerging infections that do spread, maybe not to the extent that this does. They may not be quite so virulent as this, but there will be more. We're just living in a different world where we live closer to the animal kingdom in many ways. There's industrial production of animals, farms that have many animals, people live near those. And it only takes one event, one time for the virus to cross the barrier between an animal to human to then begin to spread in humans. So yes, we will see more. Do you think the, the Imperial College, uh, Keith Chanted asked, the Imperial College studies show a lockdown of some six months. Uh, do you think this is potentially realistic? Do, do you fear a second wave? Well, modelers take the best available information at the time they make their modeling, and they're constantly changing their models. What we're going to be able to see with more predictability is those models after these surveys are done in communities. So in three weeks, models may change again. Models are constantly changing. Modelers constantly um, develop a maximum and a minimum. Unfortunately, the media and many others pick up the maximum levels and put that out as what might happen. Whereas the, the smaller, the minimum levels are quite small in some instances, depending on how rapidly um, the response activities are implemented and do occur. So modeling is really meant for the public health community so they can contingency plan based on the worst case scenario. But then the media and others take this up and they promote this as being um, possibly the truth when really all it is is an estimate. Okay, last question, because it's been 45 minutes and I can't believe it. Uh, I guess a sense of optimism, because the question is pretty simple. And I think it comes from one of the kids of one of our clients has asked, will we be okay by Christmas? <laughs> I hope we will be. And what I can say is, and I will leave everybody with this message, it's in our own hands whether or not we can control this epidemic, we or this pandemic, rather. What we have to do is learn how to protect ourselves and practice it and learn how to protect others and practice that. The government can help us. They can force us to do those measures. But if we learn ourselves, we can control this pandemic. Before we go, I want to share for those of you who have joined from uh, all over the UK um, and those who will watch this on repeat later on, uh, Maddox Gallery is partnering with the charitable organization Heroes. Now, Heroes is founded by doctors, nurses and healthcare workers to directly support our NHS staff during this time. And whether it be through the delivery of protective equipment, 
uh, masks and gloves, uh, eye protection that Professor Heyman was talking about before, whether it's counselling support for those who are struggling with the demand and loss, or the simple things such as meals and uh, with hundreds of meals being delivered across various locations each day to staff, uh, Heroes is doing everything it can to directly make the lives of NHS staff safer and easier during this time. So we've partnered with uh, our artists and uh, over 30 of them have donated work to support a campaign called Art for Heroes. I encourage you to invite to visit our website because if nothing else today, Dr. Abdul Chowdhury, who wrote to the Prime Minister about the need for personal protection equipment on March 26, today on April 9th, he passed away after contracting the coronavirus. By donating any amount or purchasing an artwork, you're directly supporting those on the front line fighting this pandemic. And I encourage you to visit www.artforheroes.co.uk to make a donation. And if you're lucky, there may be an artwork or two left to purchase. Professor Heyman, uh, thank you for taking time out of what I know is an extraordinarily busy uh, schedule. Uh, on behalf of everyone at the Maddox Gallery family, our staff, our artists, our clients, I want to uh, thank you. We appreciate your generosity in answering the questions today. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. For everyone watching, stay safe, look after yourselves and your family. Uh, Her Majesty the Queen recently shared, there's no doubt we will all meet again soon. Until then, take care of yourselves and don't forget the NHS clap this evening at 8pm. Bye for now.